Well, we are very excited for our guest on this morning's show. A, uh, you know, really just like an athlete coming out of high school, played basketball, played football. Uh, I go through some football stats real quick. Uh, in high school, 1,951 yards, uh, 20 TDs passing, 730 yards rushing. He started going to Rice playing two sports, playing football and basketball. Uh, before transferring to Gonzaga. And then he comes to Gonzaga and he's a part of four Sweet 16s, two Elite Eights, a Final Four, and a National Championship game. He just finished the season uh, over in Germany, where he uh, really turned into a certified sniper, shooting 43% from three uh, on the season. We want to welcome to the show Jeremy Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Super excited about it. I want to dive in. You know, I know when you first came into Gonzaga, the, the narrative uh, from an outsider's perspective was you've got this football player coming to Gonzaga. He's going to try to play basketball. I don't think people realize like you were a dual athlete uh, from what I understand, just as much of a basketball player mm -hmm. as a football mm -hmm. player. Talk to us a little bit. When you came out of high school, was the plan to always try and play two sports? Were you going to focus on football to start? How did that all kind of come to fruition? Yeah, so the deal with that was um, kind of had an equal love for both. And I guess early on, like freshman, sophomore, junior year of high school, if I had to pick one, it was always football. Um, and then just like we had a lot of football uh, schools coming coming to, to our practices and stuff from like, I mean, all the Texas schools, Baylor, Texas, a and like all these schools. Um, so I'm talking to all these coaches and then I start to get some, some D1 offers. I think it was going into my junior year, I want to say, or, or the spring after my, my junior season. And then I didn't have any basketball offers. So I was kind of like, uh, I guess football is going to be the way to go. You know, like I'm getting all these offers. So then I didn't play AAU my last summer which obviously hurt from a basketball perspective. And I actually started getting calls from some, some schools in basketball and I had to tell them like, I'm not playing basketball. So that was kind of weird. And then got to my senior year, fast forward to senior year of high school. And then I had a complete like change of heart. And I was like, I want to play basketball long-term. Um, but I had already committed to Rice for football. And it was, I guess, too late in a sense for me to get a, a a basketball offer the only school I was seriously talking to was Nebraska um, for basketball and, and signing day was approaching for football and I was faced with like a decision to sign with Rice um, and, and have that security or not sign with Rice and wait on Nebraska an offer from them which may never come so I just decided to sign with Rice and I, I talked to the football coach talked to the basketball coach um, and they were cool with me playing basketball as well. So that's kind of how that whole deal started. That's crazy. I never knew that, that you, before you even got into college, kind of had started thinking yeah. maybe basketball was a route. And I, I don't think people understand like Texas football. I mean, yeah, the basketball game down in Texas is, is big too, but football, I mean, that's football country down there. So I don't think people realize like what high school football mm -hmm. in Texas really means up here in the Northwest. It's, it's a big deal down in Houston and the whole Texas state. Yeah, definitely, man. It's uh, that's next level down there. Some of those stadiums are bigger than uh, almost the, <laughs> the stadiums crazy. are crazy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that stuff's different than up here for sure. Uh, I mean, so, so much goes into uh, just the high school football game um, in Texas. Like, it's almost like the whole day stops at a school um, when there's a football game. Like, classes are on pause. Like, everything's on pause, and the whole day is about the football game that's taking place at, at 7 p.m. that night. Oh, they, so they tailgate it's, it's, for a high school game. <laughs> yeah. That's <laughs> no joke. Built different down there for sure, man. Uh, so tell us a little bit, man. Obviously, Gonzaga's got some great coaches. You know, we've had a lot of great players transfer into Gonzaga. Um, but always curious, man, who was the lead recruiter that kind of started the calls with you and, and got that process going? So it's funny. I was talking to a, a, I worked out a kid the other day and I was talking to him after and I said, don't wait on colleges to reach out to you. I said, market yourself, reach out to them. So the deal with me was I took a video editing class, I think my sophomore year of high school. So I learned how to like cut film and all that kind of stuff. So 
even in high school, I started making my own highlights and sending them to coaches. So I did the same thing when I knew I wanted to transfer for Rice. I didn't wait for anyone to reach out to me. Um, I made my highlight tape. I started sending out emails to schools I was interested in. And then um, I'm not sure if, I, if y'all heard the story, but I picked up the phone and called Tommy Lloyd, his office okay. phone, and he answered his office phone. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, at first I said I was lucky, um, and then I got in trouble by my mom. She was like, you better not ever <laughs> say you're lucky. You say you're blessed, like God blessed you. So I was blessed for Tommy to answer the phone because he said he never, ever answers that office phone. So he answered the phone and we got to talking and I let him know that I had emailed him. Um, and he said he thought he was talking to my my dad at first, like someone's dad. So I thought that was kind of funny, but he looked over um, my email, my highlight tape after we got off the phone and ended up reaching out to my high school coach and I guess some past coaches and got some good intel and then reached back out. And that's kind of how it all started. I love that. I just, I don't think kids get that, that they think that they're just going to go out, do their thing. And the, the letters, the offers are going to come in. And yeah, that's not really the case for most kids that play division one athletics. Like you got to put, you got to put the work in as well. And so I love like being proactive about it. I think that's something that a lesson that a lot of kids could learn that if you want to play division one ball, like you got to do your part to get your name out there as well. They're not always going to find you. Um, so I love Definitely. that story. Yeah, man, that's, uh, you know, and one thing I always, I always love hearing too, obviously the Gonzaga redshirt program. I mean, we've seen players just take some incredible jumps through that program and their off year. Uh, tell us a little bit, man, your perspective, what was that program like for you and, and kind of, what do you think makes that redshirt program at Gonzaga so special? Well, that was the, one of the most important things for me, not ever being able to just focus on one sport, just focus on basketball. So. I knew I, I had a long, I guess, uh, a long way to go. Um, mm -hmm. I had a, a lot of growth ahead of me and I still do. Um, so so the register program was like, player development was the most important thing and that's what Gonzaga was selling. Um, so being able to do it with Nigel Williams, Goss and Jonathan Williams was obviously, I mean, it couldn't have panned out any better. Um, and, and I mean, the program's awesome. Travis Knight, second to none um like we don't we don't go in the weight room and everyone's doing the same thing it's like every, every guy kind of has their lift or their workout whatever specific to, to what they need so that's awesome um and then you have b mike donnie d um those were the main guys on the court that were um, um doing the red shirt deal but i think what's super important about that is like the practices, right? So we're on scout team all year. And when you're on scout team, like we have the ultimate green light, we can essentially almost do whatever we want. Um, and there's no repercussions really. So free to make mistakes, free to do whatever. Um, and I think that's what really, I guess, allows uh, people to excel as well is uh, the, the practice against those elite players every day. Um, back then, I think it was, um, uh, Eric McClellan, uh, Big Shemmy, um, who else is, uh, Kyle Wiltshire, Sabonis. So we're practicing against those guys every single day. And I mean, you got to figure some stuff out when you're doing that and have no choice but to get better. So I think that that's something that kind of goes under the radar. It's just being able to go at the guys that are playing every day as well. So you said when you were playing scout team, you had the green light. I got to, I got to, find out if this story is true because the story that that goes on that you hear a lot is that when bc came in and did his red shirt year few had to pull him aside a couple of times and tell him to back off a little bit playing scout team did you see any of that is that true you know i've heard the story multiple times i'll tell you um i i don't remember that i think okay. there's <laughs> i think that's a little i don't know i, I don't remember that because yeah i saw something about Jonathan Williams and I think it was was it something like that yeah I don't know maybe BC was the one putting that story out there yeah I don't, <laughs> I, I that self marketing bro I mean obviously BC is the real deal but I don't oh, yeah. I don't 
no, nah, I'm not buying that story. I don't remember that. <laughs> I want to ask you too, because I mean, for your career, I do think coming in, you know, taking that red shirt year, like getting, you know, getting right, just getting into the system, like coming in and, and learning a, a new offense, a new system can be a lot. As we've seen you, we've watched so many guys come in, take that red shirt year to just get right. And now we've got the transfer portal that, um, you know, you can come in, you can transfer out of way, which is great. Players should be able to move freely. But the only thing I'm concerned about is I think there are certain guys that still need to take a year, you know, to transfer to a, a new program and try to contribute right away. Give me your thoughts on if you're, are you a little scared? We're going to lose a little bit of that. Cause I think it's been a big part for our game. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't really know, I guess the extent of, so, so can a player transfer and sit out if they want to? Yeah, like right now. So the guys that transferred this question. year can play right away. Right, um, right, right. But can they sit out though if they choose to? I think that's between them and the, the program. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think okay. you could still take a red shirt year. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I feel like few and, and those guys will do a good job if, you know, if it's a player that they feel like needs to sit out of here, then they'll be up front letting them know. And, and if they agree, then, then they'll take that year and get better. And if it's someone that, you know, kind of like a, a old grad transfer deal where they want them to come in right away, then um, I feel like, you know, that'll work as well. But I don't, I don't think it'll hurt them. You know, those few freaking smart guy, <laughs> and I he'll he'll figure it out. <laughs> so we talked about your red shirt season. Uh, that was a grinder of a year just for Sabonis and those dudes. But then your first year that you're on the court, you end up playing on a team that goes to the national championship game. So you go from, you know, walking on at Rice to you're playing on a national championship contender team. Just take us through that season, how special that was for you, what some of your memories were from that 2016-2017 season. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was so special. Um, awesome year, obviously. Uh, but it wasn't all like, I don't know, it wasn't all beauty for me because obviously I wanted to play a lot more. Mm -hmm. But, you know, not playing – but being undefeated, you know, that's not the time to go in the coach's office and be like, you know, hey, I want some more more minutes, you know. So um, just just staying focused, staying locked in, being ready when my number was called. I think a lot of times that year I was going in like towards the end of first halves for like maybe the last minute or the last 20 seconds or something like that. But those possessions are valuable, too. So just just learning, really being in the moment, cheering the guys on, just doing whatever was needed. Um, but but we shared so many memories from that season on and off the court. Uh, we still have group chats that are still active now on, on Snapchat and that kind of stuff. Everyone still keeps in touch. So um, just super special. Um, being able to actually get in the national championship for like, I don't know, it was – I think it was one possession at the end of the, the first half. I don't know how many seconds it was, but just being able to, to be on that court was special. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't – it's hard to put that that year into words, but beautiful I'm, stuff. I'm sure, you know, in the moment you want those minutes and all that, but you look back in, in hindsight, you look at that roster and you look at how loaded – that roster was with guys playing pro ball now you yeah. know there, there's just not enough minutes to go around for anybody I'm sure everybody like even Zach Collins Zach Collins who's a lottery pick doesn't start on that team I'm sure right. he was ready to to knock down Huey's door as well let's talk about the next two seasons at GU you obviously your minutes go up each year you get to contribute a little bit more I uh, didn't get a chance to make it back to a final four but those teams had a lot of success as well um, what are some other memories that, that kind of come to mind those next two years uh, in a Zags uniform um just like always just the brotherhood you know um the the process more so than the result um and it's always fun doing it with guys that that you love um so like i said so mem so many memories on and off the court um i think what i like is how we, we used to have these meetings and it started the final four year like we wouldn't wait for something to be wrong or broken or, or you know i think oftentimes people say like if it ain't broke don't fix it so we're winning all these games so let's just keep winning the games doing what we're doing but we started having these meetings throughout the year where it was just players only meetings we get together and it's just like does anybody have anything to say get off your chest 
like this is this is where we're going this is what needs to happen that kind of deal so we kept that going the 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 next two years as well um and that was something I always enjoyed because I don't know just getting together as players and being able to speak freely um and just remain focused on the outcome um, and putting everyone's individual, I guess, goals aside for, for a bigger goal was something that I thought was cool. Who, uh, who started that? Do you remember? I have no idea. <laughs> it just happened. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't like work. Yeah. Uh, so tell us, man, after, you know, after college, obviously you had this just great career at Gonzaga. Um, and then obviously you started a good pro career as well. And, you know, that first landing spot for you right after playing at GU, uh, you played for the Kaepernick Bulls, got to play alongside your fellow Zag, Eric McClellan. Uh, and that was a place where you went. You got a lot of minutes, able to put up 15 points a game, five boards as well. I mean, could you have asked for a better situation to start your pro career? Or is there something else you had envisioned there? How'd that work out for you? Um, no, yeah, that first year was awesome. Um, and I had super low, I guess, expectations of where I was going to be able to start my pro career just based off my stats at Gonzaga. Mm -hmm. um, but being able to play there, especially them being in an international league, being in FIBA Europe Cup, so getting able to, to play teams from other countries as well was awesome. Um, and it's actually two guys I, I had previous connections with there. One guy named was Keenan Gums, and he's from San Antonio as well. Um, I played with and against him growing up. And then we brought in Eric McClellan due to some injuries. That was, that was sweet. That was, that was <laughs> awesome. My, my coach. So we had a guy get injured and, and I'm thinking like, okay, I know Eric's in Spokane working out. He hasn't signed with anyone still. So I'm like in my room about to reach out to my coach and I get a text from my coach. He's like, Eric McClellan, like, you know, like tell me about him. So then we get to talking or whatever. Um, and then maybe two, three weeks later, you know, they have to go through all this logistical stuff. Um, after practice, our GM was like, call me and he's joking with me and he's like, all right, like, it's up to you. Like, if you say we sign him, we'll sign him. If not, you know, we won't. Um, <laughs> but I was like, freaking sign him. So then <laughs> we signed him and, and yeah, and it was awesome. Um, we shared, like I said, even more memories off the court than we did on the court. Um, you know, getting together at nights, just just talking about stuff, helping each other through uh, through the season. Because I mean, ten months away is, is pretty long. So me being able to do that with him, my rookie season, um, and Keenan Gums, the other guy who I have previous connections with, was absolutely awesome. Uh, and I don't think I could have asked for a better situation in year one. I'll tell you, McClellan owes you, man. You had a prime opportunity to to totally blackmail him right there and say hey man <laughs> like what are we gonna do let, let's I'm set up something yeah let's set up something <laughs> nah <laughs> that's funny though know? um so gonzaga you know has gone to even crazier heights we keep thinking that this program has like hit its ceiling we keep thinking that okay like this is where <laughs> they're at and they just keep going they bring in their top recruiting class uh ever Talk to us a little bit about kind of just how you've seen the program change over the years. And have you had a chance to interact or will you be coming up to Spokane to see any of these dudes before the season starts? No, yeah, it's crazy. It's beautiful to see. Um, obviously, like we're, we're being the first Final Four team and then seeing what those guys was able to do last year, making it to a national championship and then getting all the questions like, oh, who's better? Who would have won? All that kind of stuff is, is kind of funny but to know that we were the first ones to get there. Um, and then, I mean, even dating back years and years to the guys, the teams that that really got this thing going, it's just still progressive, never getting stagnant. And, and I mean, the program's just on an uphill trajectory. So I think that's awesome. Um, and, and yeah, I do definitely always plan to, to get up to Spokane sometime in the summers. Last summer, I was able to, to get up there and play pickup with the guys and, and get familiar with a lot of the the new guys so that's always fun watching um that next season after you know being able to play with these guys and talk to them a little bit and actually knowing them a little bit as opposed to you know 
just being some the the new recruits on the block, the the new guys who've come in. So yeah. Sure, man. You'll have to you'll have to let us know how those pickup games go. I mean, we know some of these dudes are the real deal, but yeah, we could start know, some rumors. Uh, like I heard that they had to tell you know Jeremy Jones to take it easy on Chet a little <laughs> bit, <laughs> back off a little bit, put him through the ringer out there, man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, one thing we always try to get on here, man, we always try to get something that Zag fans, you know, most likely haven't heard. And I heard a little story, you know, of course, you're a Texas guy, you come up to Spokane and uh, man, these winners up here, these Spokane winners can just hit different. Uh, you know, I heard there might have been some car trouble going up the hill by the hospitals. And if you're not from Spokane, I mean, this this road that goes up by our hospitals, it's real steep, man. Just tell us about what these Spokane winners were like for you and uh, what happened that night. Yeah, so I don't I don't know if it was by the hospital, but I, I definitely uh, definitely experienced some 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 difficulties with the Spokane <laughs> winners. So I guess how it all started was me and my dad drove up from from Texas um, when I, when I was first going to Gonzaga. He was dropping me off and. He gave me his his truck that he was using in Texas. So two wheel drive truck, but we didn't know what we didn't know. So we drive the truck <laughs> up. I have a truck in Spokane for the snow, whatever, you know, I'm good. So then winter comes around and I get stuck one time. I'm able to like rock the car, get it out. Um, and then I get stuck like two, three, four, five more times. Um, and I mean, I guess like the weight was not heavy enough in the back of the the, mm -hmm. the truck because it wasn't four wheel drive or whatever. So I ended up calling guys. I mean, Big Dip shows up, Shimmick probably show. I mean, a bunch of guys show up and we're like pushing this this pickup truck out of the snow. Um, and then it came a point where it was like, okay, it's time to to get something that's four wheel drive. So definitely no joke. Um, Spokane winners are no joke, but it is good that, you know, we have those resources like the, the plow trucks and, and all that kind of stuff that come by. Cause I know in, in Texas, when, when we rarely get snow, it's like, it's over, you know, power's out. No one's driving because we don't have those resources down here. So, yeah. Yeah. You get 12 inches of snow up here and it's just life is normal, man. Like you're allowed exactly. to be like five minutes late and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, you need the AAA for on. when you can you can call Shemek up and say, "Hey, all right, let's get you to push this thing let's out of the pick ditch." My car up. <laughs> so, I want to do one last kind of fun exercise before we let you go. Um, Gonzaga, I don't know how much you know about Gonzaga. Used to have a football team back in the day. They used to play like Notre Dame. Haven't had one since like 1941. And what I want to go through with you is let's just act like when you were at GU. Uh, they brought the football team back. We already know what position you're playing. You don't need to say. But I want to go through some dudes that you played with and see how you might think that they would fit out on the gridiron if you're cool with it. Okay. All right. Well, we just talked about them. The first one mm -hmm. I want to know is Shemek. I mean, where where <laughs> where's Shemek fit out on the football field? I think Shemek would have to be my left tackle. You know, he'd have to – you know, I trust him with my blind side. Um, okay. Definitely left tackle. Day. Yeah. Okay. I, I like respect that. it. Yep. What about snacks? Where where would snacks fit out there? Oh man. I mean, snacks is a playmaker. So I think snacks is all over. Snacks is at receiver. Snacks is in the slot. Snacks, we're throwing snacks at at, at running back. We might throw them at some wildcats. Snacks is doing a little bit of everything. I could see him going two way a little bit. Yeah. Put yep. him at corner. Yeah. Uh BC. Where where's BC playing? Oh, BC, wide receiver for sure. We just <laughs> go deep, throw it up. Throw that up, happens, man. Happens. <laughs> Let him go full Moss. Absolutely, yeah. dude. You know he's high pointing that every time. Uh, what for about sure. what about Perk? You think you think Perk like is Perk trying to compete with you at QB? Where's where's Perk going? I think Perk is you know kind of like a DB. You know he's on his island, super confident. Mano we mano, just let him go that. man coverage with a lot of people. Got the swag, I can see that. Yeah, yeah I, I like DV <laughs> from Perk. All right. Uh, the last one, we thought this would be a, a – I have no idea where you're going with this yeah, one. That's a lot of options. Is, uh, is Rui. You know, if you put Rui on a football field, how's Rui going to make that work? <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think we'd have to go one or two ways. So, so we either have to go receiver, kind of like a like a, a Mike Evans kind of physical physical guy out at receiver, or we could go um, like a, a defensive end. Mm-hmm. Really okay. Putting pressure on those left tackles, you know, speed, strong guy, but super, super fast, fast athletic guy as well. So I think he could put some some pressure on the on the QBs as well. You're looking for that upside with Rui. You're trying to use that athleticism and see where you can get him yeah. get some matchups. Yep. Put some, maybe put a little more weight on him. <laughs> we'll let him know. Yeah. Hey Rui, <laughs> if if you ever want to play football, you have to put a little couple couple of LBs, bro. Cool, man. Hey, <laughs> thanks for joining the show this morning. We had Appreciate a blast it. chatting with you. Uh, best of luck. If you come up to Spokane, let us know. Love to have you through. And uh, we'll be continuing to watch you as you continue to uh, play ball overseas and, and do your thing. For sure. It was fun. Thanks for having me. Hopefully we can do it again sometime.